Hello everyone, welcome to Lukman IAS. Today we are going to have the Hindu newspaper analysis dated 29th of July 2023. And today we have covered many articles from the editorial section of the newspaper. And also we have covered some other important topics that are important for the prelims and mains examination. Our discussion also includes the questions for the mains exam and also for the prelims exam. And so it is requested to all of you to be regular in attending the discussion because regularity plays the role because you, you get to know about developments on, on the ongoing issues, right, on a regular basis. So let us start the discussion of the Hindu newspaper now. So these are the articles that we are going to cover in today's discussion these are the relevant areas from where these articles are related to and also page number of the hindu newspaper is mentioned over here right so in all we are going to cover these 11 topics in today's discussion right so i'll be a little quick and we will cover all the important dimensions like uh, through discussion uh, in today's lecture itself so it says uh, this is the first article this article is related to Indian economy, it is related to Indian economy, it is part of GS paper 3, okay. The main crux of this article is related to finance commission. So through this article, we will understand about what is finance commission, what is the role of finance commission. We will also learn about the previous finance commission, like you know, 12th finance commission, 13th finance commission, 14th finance commission, 15th finance commission, and also the 16th finance commission is about to be set up, right? So we are going to discuss about it. So there are many things that we are going to discuss in this article. It is important for GS paper 2 and also GS paper 3, okay? So let us start the discussion of this particular topic. The name of the topic is charting the path for the 16th finance commission. Name of the topic is Charting the path for the 16th Finance Commission. Okay. So we need to understand about what is finance commission, how our finance commission is constituted, what, uh, what is the nature of the body, what is the nature of the finance commission, okay. So let us discuss about these basic things first, right. So we will understand about what is finance commission. So finance commission is a constitutionally mandated body, okay. So finance commission are set up under article 280 of the constitution of india okay under article 280 of the constitution of india these finance commissions are set up right once every five years okay once every five years or this is set up for a period of okay five years now, what is the role of the Finance Commission? If we talk about the role of the Finance Commission, the Finance Commission plays a very important role. This role is known as like, you know, fiscal, right? This, this role is related to fiscal devolution or let's say like, you know, for having like fiscal measures for the fiscal measures for the central government, for the center, and the states and union territories states and union territories now what do we mean by fiscal measures let's say the central government receives tax right from the consumers from the people they receive tax right you know in terms of indirect taxes and direct taxes so what portion of the total tax that is received by the central government will be shared with the state governments it is mentioned by uh, like you know these things are looked into by the finance commission okay so this is the mandate i mean like whatever income that the central government is generating out of that income like from different sources like from different taxation sources 
out of that income like what portion is it to be shared with the state governments and how it is to be distributed among the state governments okay so this is the role of the finance commission and this finance commission is a multi member body okay it is generally a multi member body multi member body it is generally set up for a period of 5 years so if i talk about the 16th finance commission the central government is about to constitute the 16th finance commission okay the 16th finance commission is about to be constituted very soon and uh, you know the 15th finance commission is still 15th finance commission okay i'm just writing fc fc means finance commission right so 15th finance commission is still holds Uh, let's say like you know it's relevance why because 15th finance commission was set up by the government of india in 2017 and when the government of india has set up the 16th finance commission at that point of time there were many changes that were done okay what changes were done by the government one of the thing is introduction of gst right so the government of india has introduced gst introduction of gst you know that gst stands for goods and services tax and goods and services tax is a kind of indirect tax and they have introduced this gst and this uh, gst became an umbrella act right it replaced many indirect taxes okay it replaced many indirect taxes and it was an umbrella tax which is goods and services tax along with this like since it was established in 2017 its mandate was till 2022 however what happened like in the meanwhile this covid 19 also came okay covid 19 also came that has also affected the devolution between the central government and state government okay so the 15th finance commission has seen lot of changes it has uh, made remarkable contribution into the let's say like you know fiscal federalism okay fiscal federalism related uh, aspects so 15th finance commission largely uh, you know has done lot of changes because it was for the first time that goods and services tax was introduced by the government at that point of time okay so these are the things now in this article the author has discussed about right charting the path for the 16th finance commission why because the 16th finance commission is about to be set up so what should be the terms of reference okay so when we talk about the 16th finance commission so what should be the terms of reference for the government of india okay terms of reference what is terms of reference terms of reference means what the finance commission has to look into right what are the aspects that they need to address aspects for example uh, like uh, aspects for example like you know vertical devolution okay vertical devolution then another aspect is like you know what should be the horizontal devolution so let us first understand about what do we mean by vertical devolution vertical devolution means like you know whatever taxes that the central government receives from different kind of taxation like goods and services tax right whatever income the central government generates so how much of this uh, amount how much what percentage of it will be distributed among the states right from the center to states like how much percentage of it will go let's say like you know uh, the center is uh, let's say uh, generating 100 let's say like you know 100000 crore or like you know 100 percent of something and out of which what percent has to go to the state let's say it is 42 percent or let's say it is 41 percent right so this particular thing is known as vertical devolution vertical devolution means out of total receipts how many percentage of it will go to all the states from the center center has 100 rupees out of which what how uh, like you know what amount will go to the states okay all the states together as of now let's say like in india we have 28 states like we have states we have union territories so how what portion of the central fund will go to the states that is known as vertical devolution apart from this there is another terminology which is known as horizontal devolution okay we are going to understand about another thing which is known as horizontal devolution horizontal devolution 
So what do we mean by horizontal devolution? Horizontal devolution means, let's say from center, the states have, have received 41 percentage of the total fund. So like, you know, how the fund will be distributed, let's say like, you know, among states, okay, how the fund, let's say total fund that the states receive is 41 rupees, how it will be distributed among all the state, let's say state one, state two, etc. Right? States and union territories, how it is going to be distributed among them. That is known as horizontal devolution. So, related to vertical devolution, also, like you know, the Finance Commission looks into multiple aspects, right? You know, what are the areas from where the central government generates, let's say, revenue, right? What are the areas? Uh, from which the state government generate uh, revenue. So the finance commission has to look into multiple aspects before deciding the vertical devolution. So according to the uh, like on you know, a 15th finance commission initially they have decided right uh, the 14th finance commission has decided that 42 percent of the total proceeds should go to the states but later on it was revised why because one of the state was let's say categorized as to union territories. The state of Jammu and Kashmir had been converted into union territories. So then the 15th finance commission has made it 41% for the state. Okay. So that uh, thing has been made 41%. Now, again, in case of horizontal devolution, let's say like whatever fund that the state governments have, right? So uh, that the state governments together will be given. So among the states, how it is going to be distributed. So for this, like, you know, they look into multiple, uh, let's say criteria. Okay. They look into multiple criteria for distribution among the states. All the states are not given equal amount of money, equal amount of fund. Why? Because every state has different geographical territory. Every state has different population. Every state has different capacity of generation of money, right? So looking into all those aspects, so they look into, let's say, one area which is population, right? They also see population dividend of the state. They also look into income distance, okay? They look into income distance. So what is income distance? Let's say among all the states that India has, let's say 28 states India has, among all the states, the top three states, like, you know, uh, when we talk about the states, so uh, for calculation of the fund of the state, we identify gross state, uh, you know, this domestic product like for the entire country we have gross domestic product in case of states we have gross state domestic product so they look into the top three states that have the highest gross state domestic product so from highest gross state domestic product they calculate the difference let's say like you know there is a state one a state one it has some gross state development uh, this you know gross state uh, domestic product then they will look into two they will look into three and let's say like a state 10 with respect to state 10 how much state 10 is let's say away from state one okay from the average of of the top three state so that is known as income distance okay so they also look into the income distance part apart from this income distance they also see uh, like you know demographic change right they see demographic change these are demographic change means like you know how the state is let's say contributing into education of people right a uh, lot of these social factors are also looked into apart from this they also look into area issues like forest cover why forest cover because the central government wants to promote more forestation, more afforestation in different states. Those states that have more forest, right? So they will be having lesser industries in them. So these states needs to be incentivized because these states are doing 
right they are built for the environmental purposes okay so that forest cover is also taken into account so there are two as two aspects to it one of the aspect which is like you know that includes incentives other is let's say like you know related to the uh, the statutory requirement okay like population and income distance and uh, let's say total geographical area so there are multiple factors that the finance commission look into before coming into this particular ratio i mean like you know this particular criteria list like these are the criteria that we are going to look into to distribute fund among the states and that is known as horizontal devolution okay that is known as horizontal devolution so now the author has talked about many other uh, things also related to this okay what are the things that the author has talked about the author has talked about debt to gdp ratio debt to gdp ratio so what do we mean by debt to gdp ratio so debt to gdp ratio is calculated for the center it is calculated for the states also for example if i talk about center what will be the uh, centers debt to gdp ratio okay centers debt to gdp ratio okay debt to gdp ratio what will it be it will be like how much debt the central government has okay how much that the central government has that means like uh, how much borrowing the central government has made and what is the gdp of the country okay so that will be the debt to gdp ratio and uh, there is something which is known as fiscal responsibility and budget management okay we have frbm act in india fiscal responsibility and budget management act frbm act and that particular frbm act has mandated that the center should have a certain okay center should have certain debt to gdp ratio debt to gdp ratio certain means like it should be under limit and the state should state should also adhere to right states uh, a state should also adhere to certain debt to gdp uh, gsdp ratio okay gross state domestic product ratio like that so frbm mandates that the central government should have right it should have less than 40 percent in, and a state should have less than equal to 40 percent in case of central government and in case of a state government it should be less than or equal to 20 percent the debt to gdp ratio according to the frbm act fiscal responsibility and budget management act however the combined this you know uh, debt to gdp ratio of center and state has crossed 90 percent it has crossed 90 percent and which is not right which is not good because it showcases more debt like you know more borrowings that the central go central government and the state government has done okay so this is one part now like you know combined thing has gone up and like it has gone little down also but still it is much above the mandated criteria of the this particular thing fiscal responsibility and budget management act okay so it says centers uh, debt to gdp ratio must be less than or equal to 40 percent however it is presently 58.7 percent and for states it should be less than or equal to 20 percent it says it is more than 31 percent okay so these are the things okay so in this article the author has discussed about these issues like debt to gdp ratio related thing and also the horizontal devolution how it should happen what are the criteria that they should look into uh, it has also talked about vertical devolution and also like you know they need to be more uh, like innovative the finance commission needs to be more innovative so that they can also look into certain factors that have not been taken into account by previous finance commissions okay so as i discussed that the finance commission is a constitutionally mandated body it is constituted under article 280 of the constitution of india it is set up for a period of five years by the government right and the 16th finance commission is about to be set up by the government okay so uh, once you read uh, like you know this article you will understand that uh, the author finally makes a point that corrective uh, correcting excessive cesses 
freezing the weight of income distance criteria and sharper monitoring of fiscal deficit are the areas that need attention okay so author has made these points while you know talking about uh, this particular topic so i hope you might have understood this topic in your free time you also need to understand and read about terms of reference of 15th finance commission so that you understand these things so with this like we have two questions for you one question is for the means exam so it says what is finance commission discuss discuss about the okay it is discuss about the a b o u t about the composition nature and function of the finance commission you need to write this answer in 150 words after writing you can share your answer with us at evaluation at lukman ias dot com right after writing you need to share it with, with us at evaluation at lukmanis.com so with this let us solve the prelims question it says consider the following statements about finance commission so this question is about finance commission again it says which of the above statements is or are true we need to identify which statements are true number one the first commission was established in 1951 under the Finance Commission Miscellaneous Provision Act 1951. So they are now asking about when was first Finance Commission established. Second, the parliament may by law determine the requisite qualification for appointment as members of the commission and the procedure of selection. Right. So it says the parliament may determine how uh, like you know about the qualification for appointment of members so in every finance commission there is a let's say like you know uh, the uh, there uh, there are different members of the finance commission and there is a head or chairperson of the finance commission so now it is talking about that parliament has this particular authority so let us look into the solution of this question it is let's say answer c means both the statements are right first statement First Finance Commission was set up in 1951 and it says Parliament has the authority to uh, determine the qualification of the members of the Finance Commission, right? So with this, like, we will move to the next topic and also in your free time, you can download the PDF of the discussion. First you download the PDF, then you attend the discussion so that like, you can also follow this particular uh, PPT, right? So... Let's talk about another topic. This is also a very important topic. This topic says a spectacle of repentance and symbolic inclusion. So this topic is related to it is very important for GS paper one of the means exam, right? And also it is important for GS paper two, right? Uh, it is important for GS paper one and paper two as well. So let us discuss about the uh, let's say this particular topic. This is a very important topic. Okay, it, it talks about the society that India has now. Okay, so the topic two. Let's. Uh, so it says a spectacle of repentance and symbolic inclusion. A spectacle of repentance and symbolic inclusion. So in this topic, let's say we are going to understand about the social structure in India. Okay, we are going to discuss about social structure with reference to caste. Okay, we are going to discuss about caste related aspect, right? So we are going to discuss about some of the recent happenings and also we are going to discuss about some of the uh, an act which is in place related to let's say like you know prohibiting the discrimination right so let's discuss about this it says uh, so basically if we talk about hinduism right in hinduism we do have a fourfold okay we have fourfold caste structure okay caste structure in this society it had right it had this fourfold caste structure so one of the caste is brahmins 
Then we have Kshatriyas. Then we have Vaishyas. And we have Shudras. So the, this particular caste hierarchy or caste structure is as per the Manu Smriti. Okay. It is as per Manu Smriti. So if I talk about this caste based structure, so Brahmins were those people like who were considered as intellectuals. Okay. They were intellectuals who were helping the kings right in taking decisions so brahmins occupied the topmost place in the society in earlier times right during the time of manu smriti or during the time of kings and queens in the country then had the kshatriya kshatriyas were the warrior class okay they were the warrior class in the society right vaishyas were the business people right they were business people and then there were shudras who were serving right who were serving and who were doing manual work for example cleaning and other kind of activities so this fourfold caste structure caste based structure in the society was existing and here like you know mobility was possible right mobility was possible mobility means a person could move from one caste to another let's say one uh, one could move from vaishyas to kshatriyas or kshatriyas to brahmins or shudras to vaishyas or le let's say like you know vice versa so they could move and it was based on occupation of people right what occupation people were involved in so like you know this particular thing was existing but at this point of time if i talk about present india right at this point of time in india what we have we have the constitution of india and we are doing a lot of thing right you know as constitutionally mandated thing to bring equity among people right to bring equity equity means like we want to bring equality equality okay we want to bring equality in this society and so basically what is the context of this particular connotation recently what has happened like one person one person who happened to belong to bharatiya janta party bjp he was let's say one of the functionary of the bharatiya janta party he has recently i mean like you know eased upon means like he has done urination on right a dalit person i mean like a, 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 a on a person from lower caste okay on a person from lower caste so that B, uh, bgp functionary he was from an upper caste right he is from upper caste in this society and he has done urination on or let's say like he has done this thing uh, this is known as indecorous behavior. He has shown indecorous behavior against a lower caste person. And soon after then, what has happened? The chief minister, okay, CM of Madhya Pradesh. What he has done, CM of Madhya Pradesh has washed, right? The feet, okay, washed the feet of the victim, feet of the victim why he has done so because this particular activity of the upper caste person has showcased that like you know atrocities happen at ground level in this society and to to stop the atrocities in india we do have an act also right this act actually prohibits the atrocities against the lower caste people right so we do have scheduled tribes uh, like you know scheduled uh, commission okay so we have national commission for scheduled caste national commission for scheduled tribes so these commission look into these aspects that like you know these people should not be subject to any kind of atrocities atrocities means harsh behavior or kind of uh, act of violence against them right so he has washed the feet and this particular incident so this is not just a, a simple incidence it has let's say like you know orchestrated a political opinion among people so people had divided opinion uh, about this uh, you know cm's uh, activity uh, they said like you know it is just uh, done to let's say like you know weed away 
the uh, atrocities that were done by this particular person in this incident and this was just a symbolic gesture it was let's say like you know it showcases repentance right what it showcases it showcases repentance what do we mean by repentance a kind of let's say regret okay repentance means sincere regret sincere regret so this was done by the chief minister of madhya pradesh to showcase sincere regret right uh, towards uh, the people from the lower caste in the state however soon after that many more such incidents has happened and at, at that time the uh, the chief minister of the state of madhya pradesh did not do anything so this is an incident that has uh, you know sparked political debate political debate and debate in the society about uh, let's say upper caste people doing atrocities against the lower caste people at the society so that has you know brought about this particular discussion however this discussion also sparks some of the thing related to the caste based structure in the society and here in this article the article has been written by a person from congress party i mean like in this article he has talked about the rss also rss rashtriya swayam sevak sang so they say that rss let's say like you know uh, like uses right uh, rss has uh, like it gets uh, gets its ideological world view on caste from the arya samaj movement okay from where from arya samaj movement okay it gets it from arya samaj movement and apart from this it says that rss has like you know in the society in india around the world we do have concepts like equality we have concepts like equity then right to equal access lot of things these are let's say modern values that different countries have adopted for themselves and in constitution also constitutionally also we have adopted this particular thing in our constitution that right to equality we have adopted we have also included the provision so that right you know atrocities do not happen against the lower caste people however the author says that rss uh, this rss let's gets its ideological world view from the arya samaj movement and also it creates a fictional state right it creates a fictional state for itself and the author has said that the fictional state is is an imaginary state that that it creates and it is similar to the state of nature okay it is similar to state of nature state of nature that different okay state of nature uh, of liberal contract theorist okay so it says uh, that in this article he has said that social mobility was possible in the caste based structure which was not good because that was needed at that point of time however the society has changed in india and elsewhere also with changing society we also need to change our let's say like you know uh, our constitutional thing we need to keep pace with the changing nature of the society and we need to bring more human structure into the society and the author says that arya samaj has come up with its own definition right of uh, you know which is uh, they are equating this thing and they say like it, it brings this particular notion of hindutva okay it says like it brings the notion of hindutva and the author has also talked about like what are uh, different connotations of hindutva in this article okay so you need to read this article to understand about the caste based structure and also understand about that like how this thing right you know how this particular incidents has sparked political opinion because people have divided opinion some people say this was just a let's say like you know fan fair kind of event that the madhya pradesh cm has taken other people say that like you know this was a rightly done act by the chief minister to bring a notion of social harmony in the state okay so this article talks about social harmony some of the concepts that they have mentioned is samarasta uh, okay or social harmony it also talks about let's say social justice or samajik nyay it talks about samanta okay samata means equality like that okay so you need to read this article to understand about social uh, 
social stratification or social things in this society. Now, let's discuss about this topic. Now, why this, uh, like, you know, why we have asked a question on National Security Act? Because the person who has, let's say, eased himself, right, on the lower caste people, against him, the state government has applied, the government has applied National Security Act. And they have also bulldozed the house of the, uh, of the let's say, BGP functionary. So that's why it is important. Now, let us discuss about this. It says, consider the following statements regarding National Security Act. Which of the above statements are true? We need to identify, okay? It says, the NSA is a preventive detention law enacted to maintain public order and national security. Second, the NSA empowers the center or state government to detain a person to prevent him from acting in any manner prejudici prejudicial to national security. The maximum period for which one may be detained is three months. Okay, so it says three months. So basically the maximum period can go up to 12 months. Okay, it is 12 months. So these two statements are right. I mean, uh, like, you know, first and second are right. The third is wrong. So correct answer would be option A, one and two only. Option A would be the right answer in this case. So with this, we will move to another topic quickly. And we have also included the solution to this uh, like you know, question. You can go through the explanation in your free time. Now, this is another article. This is also a very, very important article. Okay. So we are going to discuss about this article. It says, land use changes putting rocky addresses land use changes putting rocky addresses of animals under stress in shahiyadri plateau so recently some scientists what they have done some scientists have gone to the shahiyadri plateau and they have upturned or overturned various rocks in that particular place to identify how many animals are living over there uh, was there any like you know they have also done this study to identify was there any ecological change because of changing cultivation pattern in that particular area so it says the rapid shift from traditional local grain cultivation to monoculture plantation of mango and cashew in the Sahyadri plateaus of Madhya uh, Maharashtra is impacting elusive amphibians insects and reptiles that live under a crop under a crop of rocks or like loose rocks like that so land use changes have shifted earlier people were doing local grain cultivation but now they have shifted to monoculture plantation and this has also let's say affected the habitat of the amphibians of insects and reptiles that live under these rocks okay so the scientists have upturned about 7000 such rocks and they could identify only right less than 30 animals right under 7000 rocks so this shows a grim state of nature there i mean like where the animals are let's say like you know shifting their living pattern in the sense the animals are rarely found many animals have gone as extinct so this is just a what we say update on the uh, activity that were done by the scientists and they have mentioned names of some of these insects or animals so they say white striped viper gecko okay so this is a name white striped viper gecko which is known as hemi the chylatus abdo fasciatus okay this is the scientific name of this thing and also they have the uh, shesha charis uh, cassilian which is like you know genospis shesha uh, chari means like these are scientific names very technical i mean like to read Right, in your free time, you can read about it to understand how, uh, like, you know, the land use changes have affected the uh, lives of these insects, amphibians and reptiles, right, that live under the rock, okay, under the loose rocks. So, with this, we came to another topic. This topic is also very important. It says, Bill proposes president as visitor to all IAMs. Experts fear impact on autonomy. Okay, so IAMS means Indian Institute of Management. As you know, that Indian Institute of Management are autonomous institutions of higher learning. I mean, like they 
provide uh, PGDM courses, MBA courses, PhD courses, right? So they are uh, institute uh, management institutes at higher level. And in IIMs, I mean, like you know, many toppers go, right? So to study in IIMs, one has to qualify the CAT examination. And IIMs have been given autonomy by the government, right? So these IIMs do have a lot of role, like you know, to play in the society. However, recently the government of India has notified that they want to amend the Indian Institute of Management uh, Act. Okay, so already Indian Institute of Management Act 2017 is in place and the government of India wants to amend it. After amending, they want to include a provision of visitor. Okay, visitor. And who will be the visitor? The president of India will be made as visitor to IIM. Okay, the president of India will be made as visitors, uh, visitor to IIM and he or she can visit in any IIM at any point of time. And the visitor, I mean, or the president of India will be given lot of, let's say, authority. Authority to, let's say, decide who will be the uh, who will be the chairperson of the uh, of the let's say board of directors and who will be the director i mean like you know uh, the president of india will have the authority of deciding the board of governors of selecting the chairperson and also the president of india will have the authority to remove the director of the iim right so lot of things are mentioned in this article related to the power of the visitor right so experts are saying that right experts are saying that it is going to meddle with the autonomy of the indian institute of management and if autonomy is taken away in that case these indian institute of management will be ruled right you know will be regulated similar to other central universities okay so the government of india has central universities and those universities are ruled in certain manner so like you know this particular amendment is going to bring that structure to IIMs okay so this is the thing then we have another article this article is very important why it is important because recently the prime minister of India has attended in a semicon India conclave okay a semicon India conclave was conducted recently in the state of Gujarat, right? And what was the purpose of Semicon in, uh, India? Means semiconductor India. Basically, we want to promote manufacturing of semiconductors in India so that the chips, like you know, inside the mobile phone, inside the laptops, inside other electronic devices, can be manufactured in India. Presently, India does not have the facilities for manufacturing these chips in India, right? It is being manufactured outside India in many places, right? In India, we have very limited capacity of producing it. But recently in that particular conclave, the, press, uh, the Prime Minister of India has spoken with the industry leaders and these industry leaders, I mean like, you know, uh, involve many big big companies who have been into the business of manufacturing the semiconductor uh, like you know semiconductors or semiconductor chips right and here the prime minister of india has made a remarkable speech where he has invited the business players from across the world to invest in india in facilities for let's say establishing these semiconductor chip making uh, companies in india right so this was a step that is taken by the prime minister of india to promote the culture of semiconductor making in india and what has happened uh, there is a company which is known as advanced micro devices amd so this company has announced that it is going to invest around 400 million dollar right in india for manufacturing of the chips okay chips means uh, semiconductor chip in in, in india so that's the thing. So this is just an uh, uh, like let's say update related to this industry. If I talk about like where India stands at this point of time in making the uh, chips. So India is lagging behind many countries that includes China, United States of America. It includes let's say uh, Taiwan, uh, also Hong Kong, right? So uh, South Korea, 
they also have the manufacturing facility over there so india is currently lagging behind many of these countries who are let's say like who have emerged as one of the uh, top leaders in the world in manufacturing semiconductors in their countries right along with this like we have certain updates related to semiconductor field i mean like you know similar to that so this is important for the prelims exam so we are going to understand about this it says us chip maker amd to invest 400 million in india says cto okay so uh, like this particular person is from this company amd advanced uh, like you know micro devices so this company has announced that it is going to invest 400 million dollars in india for making chips right so this is the thing second our made in india chip will be ready in 2.5 years okay so recent another article where uh, uh, like you know vedanta group chairman anil agarwal said that first phase of semiconductor project will involve 5 billion dollar investment of the overall 20 billion outlay okay so in india also we will be able to manufacture these chips so it will take around 2.5 years from now to let's say start uh, making semiconductors in india apart from this there is micron to create ready to ship semiconductor chips okay micron is another company it is uh, uh, it will create ready to ship semiconductor chips right so these are some of the let's say developments related to it so dram projects nan products lot of thing nan gates right so uh, these are parts of uh, let's say digital devices right digital devices have the semiconductors in them right so with this let us move to the next topic it says need legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution so recently what has happened this is a new topic this topic is related to gs paper 3 of the means exam under environment and ecology okay environment and ecology i am writing e and e so recently the prime minister of india has attended a virtual right you know uh, attended a virtual meeting of g20 of g20 environment ministers meeting okay it is known as g20 environment ministers meeting so the prime minister of india has attended this particular meeting and he has discussed with the environment ministers of all g20 countries and in that meeting the prime minister of india has said that we need legally binding in international instrument okay so we need an internationally okay we need an internationally legally binding instrument instrument to end to end plastic pollution so this was uh, a comment that was made by the prime minister of india that like you know the global uh, like you know countries should work among themselves in such a manner so that like we can bring an internationally legally binding instrument so that we can ban the plastic pollution right along with this the prime minister of india has also highlighted about intended nationally determined contributions okay so government of india has adopted intended and uh, nationally determined contributions and we have been able to achieve these intended nationally determined contributions nine years be uh, before the 2020 uh, 2030 target so we have been able to achieve them by 2021 itself so the prime minister of india has said that india was able to achieve it for itself and also we have uh, we have uh, you know taken a target for ourselves of attaining net zero right net zero emission by 2070 we want to achieve this particular thing and the prime minister has talked about the un climate convention and also he has referred to paris agreement to help global south okay global south we discussed in previous articles what do we mean by global south global south is a kind of solidarity among the developing nations uh, across the world that most of these nations lie in the southern hemisphere that includes south america as a continent it, it includes many african countries it includes let's say india it includes china 
although china and india are totally lying in the northern hemisphere but they are part of global south because they are developing nations okay so the prime minister of india has talked about that the developing nations together should you know look for alternative sources of let's say energy so that right so that like we can meet our developmental goal also we can meet our developmental needs along with uh, uh, going for alternative sources of energy he has uh, uh, the prime minister of india has also talked about the conservation initiatives in india that he discussed that like you know 70 percent of the world's tigers are in india it is because of the let's say like you know conservation efforts that are taken by india and apart from this he has also talked about project lion and project dolphin he discussed that like you know namami gange project the government of india has namami gange mission under which the river cleaning activities have been taken up by the government and now dolphins have started let's say like you know uh, like we have been able to see dolphins in the rivers okay like that so this is just an ongoing thing related to the prime minister's let's say uh, meeting with the g20 environment ministers uh, meeting okay Envi environment ministers of g20 now the present law minister of india is mr arjun ram meghwal so recently he was asked in the parliament of india so he was asked an unstarred question okay he was asked an unstarred question in the parliament and to every unstarred question they should give a written response okay the concerned minister should give written response so what has happened uh, this law minister was asked whether like you know uh, there is a proposal uh, in the government to amend the anti-defection law what is anti-defection law anti-defection law is mentioned in the 10th schedule of the constitution of india 10th schedule of the constitution of india and under 10th schedule of constitution of india they have mentioned right uh, the procedure of disqualification of persons who defect from their political parties those candidates who get elected as an independent member right if they join a political party so like they can be disqualified by the speaker of the house and if a person got elected from the seat of a one political party and after getting elected if that person joins another political party he will again be disqualified right by the speaker so like you know these provisions of disqualification of those members who defect from their own uh, let's say political party are mentioned in the 10th schedule of the constitution of india so recently the law minister of india was asked whether there is a proposal of amending or changing the 10th schedule so he has clarified that as of now there is no proposal to amend it and we are not going to amend it now i mean like you know there can be uh, some proposal in future we don't know but like as of now there is no such question of amending the 10th schedule of the constitution of india so there are many things that we can discuss as part of 10th schedule but it is recommended that you read it yourself because like it keeps on coming in the news time and again so we have another topic this is again a very important article it says mercury rising climate change calls for renewed sense of urgency okay recently what has happened the united nations Secretary, uh, Secretary General, okay, United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, okay, I'm just writing G, Mr. Antonio Guterres, what he has said, he has recently referred that a era of global boiling has come. Earlier, like we were talking about global warming, okay, we were talking about global warming. However, he has said that the era of global warming has ended and now we have entered into a new phase where global boiling is happening. Okay, he said global boiling is happening and this is a very, very uh, like, you know, alarming situation for the entire world. Why alarming? Because, because of global boiling, 
lot of ice will be melted these ice i mean like will convert into water these water will add up into the ocean and the sea level will rise and if the sea level rises the island nations those nations that are uh, built on the islands so they will submerge they will submerge below water and recently the prime minister of india has also talked about he has referred to these island nations as like you know small uh, he has referred small island nations small island nations he has told small island nations as large ocean countries okay he has referred large ocean countries and he has talked about the importance of bringing the climate change right uh, at a certain level so that like climate warming does not happen beyond that level so this is the thing and in this article they have mentioned that july 2023 was the hottest month okay july 2023 was the hottest month on record in the past 100 and uh, some uh, 176 years i think right 174 years so in the past 174 years july 2023 was the hottest month on the planet earth okay so this is indeed a global boiling situation okay so that's a that's a very important topic right so you just need to understand that like you know now you can also mention in your answers related to gs paper 3 uh, global boiling related thing you can refer to uh, refer this uh, right uh, in many of the answers that you are going to write so niger right it says army general declares himself leader of niger so let me just quickly uh, you know try to draw a short map of uh, let's say africa let's say this is the map of africa very rough sketch of africa okay very rough uh, rough sketch of africa so this is where niger is located okay it's a country so in niger they have internal security problem what kind of internal security problem there are many factions inside niger who are fighting with one another okay so it is let's say insurgent hit country and recently the elected prime minister of niger right democratically elected uh, prime minister of niger was ousted okay uh, ousted from his post basically this person the image that we see he is a army general he is army general of niger what he has done they have launched a coup coup means a military operation and they have taken hostage the elected representatives they have taken uh, you know hostage the elected uh, the president of niger his name is mohammad wazum he was detained by the uh, army general and after then he has declared himself as the uh, president of niger okay so this military coup has happened in niger and this has sparked outrage in the world earlier this niger was a colonial country of france okay niger was a colony of france and the french president okay french president mr emmanuel macron he has said that the army leader should free the elected president okay he should free from detention the elected president and he should restore the peace in the country okay so this is just an update related to this aspect you need to just read it and understand that like what has been happening in the state of uh, state means country niger right in international law international relations countries are known as states right so this is the thing then we have another topic it says government allows indian companies to list on foreign exchange right through ifsc now this is a very very important topic this is related to gs paper 3 of the mains exam this is a very important topic under economy section indian economy section why it is important because this topic talks about corporate bonds okay it talks about corporate 
bonds so we will discuss about this topic recently the finance minister of india has inaugurated two uh, like you know institutions so you might be knowing that like in gujarat in the state of gujarat we have set up international financial services center ifs stands for international financial services center so let me write down this okay ifs stands for international financial services center where it is located it is located in gift city in gujarat so basically the government of india wants to boost corporate bonds okay what it wants to boost it want to boost corporate bond market okay and for this the government of india has set up bodies okay it has set up bodies i am going to write the names of these bodies because it is very important because like today like this topic has come in news and in future you will see many many such articles in the editorial section of the newspaper so the government of india has set up uh, a body which is known as limited purpose clearing corporation okay a body known as limited purpose clearing corporation right it has set up limited purpose clearing corporation and uh, like you know mechanism lpcc mechanism lpcc mechanism and this lpcc mechanism will be known as right amc repo clearing limited okay it will be known as amc repo clearing limited am arcl okay it is known as arcl this is an important body that has been established and also they have established another body which is known as uh, corporate debt market development fund okay they have set up corporate debt market development fund okay c DMF Corporate Debt Market Development Fund CDMDF These two bodies have been set up by the government and they have been set up for the purpose of let's say like you know building a corporate bond market in India and many companies in India with uh, many public companies basically so uh, I'm going to write them many public companies in india whether they are listed or they are unlisted okay or not listed okay unlisted whether they are listed or unlisted companies they will be able to list themselves okay they will be able to directly list themselves in international financial services center ifsc and this will lead to that like you know multinational companies or foreign investments okay it will lead to foreign inflow or forest investment in these companies in these companies so this is the thing i hope you have understood we want to develop corporate bond market means corporates may issue bonds right and these bonds may be purchased by investors and these corporate uh, entities will receive the fund and they will utilize this fund for let's say growth of the corporate right growth of the corporates so whenever they need money so they can issue corporate bonds and for that they can 
uh, get themselves listed in International Financial Services Center directly, right? Without having to get themselves listed in uh, National Stock Exchange or Bombay Stock Exchange and all. So this is a good topic. I mean, like, you know, here we have discussed about this thing. So that's all for the time being for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session. I hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you.